uh, they visited and uh, they just said that your church it was just, we just loved it. The, the singing, people sang with conviction and uh, with, with, with great heartiness, I think was the word he used. And uh, that is a blessing. People know what they're singing and they sing out because they believe it. Well, praise the Lord for that. Psalm 119. Oh, did I dismiss the kids already? No. Did they go by themselves? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be gone. Be gone. Oh, I probably should just say get out. I mean, leave. Okay. You, you may be dismissed. Psalm 119. And uh, I haven't even got hardly to the introductions of the psalm or anything yet. I, I started in verses 25 to 32, and, and that's where we're going to continue today. And we'll go back to the first few verses here, probably next week or the week after. But. Um, here in uh, this section, uh, we were looking at some of the highlights, not necessarily verse by verse, but a couple of the unique features of this psalm, and, um, and one of them here is open, honest prayer, and we're going to look at that here in the first part, and then, Lord willing, we will get to uh, the last verse where he says, uh, you shall enlarge my heart. Uh, so these are two important features of this section. Notice in verse 26. Well, let's start at verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Uh, I believe David was the author. And in this psalm here, when he wrote Psalm 119, he was going through a terrible situation in his life. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, we're not sure. But he, he's lying prostrate on the ground, crying out to God. He's physically sick, nearing death, or emotionally or spiritually. But he's in a desperate situation. His soul clings to the dust. And then in verse 26, he says, I have declared my ways, and you answered me. Teach me your statutes. Make me to understand the way of your precepts, so shall I meditate on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me your law graciously. Now, this first section here that I talked about, the open, honest prayer, we find that in two, four verses, two couplets. Uh, first of all, verse 26 and 27, where he says, I have declared my ways, and you answered me. And then down in verse 29 and 30, where David says, remove from me the way of lying. He says, I've declared my ways. David is telling God, he says, God, I, I'm opened up. I've, I've spilled my guts. I, I'm, I'm honest before you. I've declared my ways. Uh, and basically what he's saying is he's, he's gone to prayer and he's, he's telling God everything. He's not trying to hide. You know, by the way, you can't hide anything from God. You might as well tell him. <laughs> you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm not going to tell God that in prayer. Or he'll never know. Yeah, let's not kid ourselves. He knows everything, okay? So he... David says, I'm, I'm telling you, this is my life. This is my way. I declare it my ways. This is my life, Lord. This is how I've been living it. Uh, and and he, I'm sure he was ashamed of it, but he says, this is what I've been doing, Lord. This is how I've been living. This is the, what I've been doing with myself. And, and I'm declaring it to you, God. I'm, I'm opening up. I'm confessing it all to you. That's what it is, isn't it? It's an acknowledgement. It's a confession. It's an open up to God and, 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 and pouring out his heart. That's what true prayer is, by the way. It's not quoting a few things or saying a few old cliches that us Christians normally have. we got all these little cute prayer sayings that we all have in our prayers. Well, David's not doing that. He's opening up his heart and just telling God everything. This is how I've been living, Lord. This is the way I've been walking and what I've been doing. And he says, and you answered me. God always does. And, uh, and David's response was, teach me your statutes. Yeah. David knows this is the way I've been walking. This is the ways I've been going. My, and the word ways, these are my paths. This is how I've been living is what he's talking about. And he's declared that to God. And, and then God answered him. And then David replied, okay, <laughs> I want to know your ways because my ways aren't working. The ways I've been walking are wrong. In fact, later on in, in verse 30 there, uh, he says, I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. 
And so that's part of the teaching. When God replied to David, David had spilled his heart out to God and God answered him. And, and David lays God's judgments before him and he realizes, boy, I'm, a lot, I'm not living the way I ought to. When I compare my ways with God's ways, there's a problem here. And David says, I want to know your ways. In fact, in verse 29, what does he say? <laughs> Teach me your side. Make me understand the way of your precepts. That's back in verse 27. And so as, as he lays God's judgments before him, and God opens his eyes, and, and, and this is God's ways. These are God's paths, or the way he ought to be walking, and he, he measures his life, not according to how other his peers are doing. He measures his life, his ways, according to God's ways. Amen. And when we measure our life according to God's ways, we find out that we are liars and God is truth. My life is not right. God's is right. Amen. And I want to do according to God's will. Amen. And that's what David said. When I put your law there, your judgments out, and I lay them before me, I find out that I'm a liar. Notice that in verse 29. David says, remove from me the way of lying. So this prayer now, David declares to God his ways. He spills it all out. He acknowledges what he's been doing and how he's been living. And then he, let, he measures his life according to God's word. He says, I want to know your ways. I want to know your truth. Teach me that. And God does. And when God teaches him the truth, he says in verse 29, remove from me the way of lying. He comes to the conclusion that my life doesn't measure up to, the, to your standard of truth. Now, I don't believe David was any more of a liar than anyone here this morning. But I believe when David was in the Word of God every day, he was seeing how his life and his lips were not true. His speech oftentimes may have been half-truths. Out of context. Exaggerations. Maybe a little misleading. White lies. Maybe some big lies. But when David measures his life and his speech according to God's word, he's a liar. <coughs> <coughs> and his life, it wasn't just what he said and how he talked that he realized he wasn't completely true, but his very life was kind of hypocritical maybe. And he wasn't coming across honestly before people. He was, he was covering things up. He was, he was somewhat of a hypocrite. Maybe he, when David went to the temple, he would, he would smile and cover up a lot that was really burdening his heart. <coughs> what is that called? That's called hypocrisy. That's called not being true. And so that on our outward appearance and what we come across to people as is different than what we really are inside, that's a lie, isn't it? And I think David, in studying God's word, realized, God, I'm a liar. My life and my lips aren't true. I want to be a truther, though. <laughs> when I read your word, I, I want to do what's true and honest and right, and I want my life to be that way. And so what does he do? Not only is there a confession of sin, and there's a repentance, there's a turning, there's a resolve. He says, I want to know your truth. And then he says what in verse, at the end of verse 29, he says, remove from me the way of lying and grant me your law graciously. He realizes that he's a liar and he, <coughs> that's not enough, is it? Just to recognize that we're not living right. Some people admit, oh, no, I know I'm not living right. But true repentance is a turning from that to doing what is right and holy. That's true repentance where there's an about face. And David says, I'm a liar. I don't want to be a liar. But even that, even with the confession of his ways were wrong, even his desire to do right, that's not enough. Choosing the right course of action doesn't make it happen. We need God's help. You can't do it on your own. I can't muster up the uh, just the willpower to be holy. And that's why David says to God in prayer, remove from me the way of lying. 
Take that out of my life. Give me victory over that. He calls on God for help. And he asks that God would give him his law. Grant me your law graciously. David just didn't say, I want to give me a copy of that so I can stick it in my back pocket. I, don't, don't just give me your law to, so I can understand it. No, it was more than that. Grant me your law graciously. In other words, I want you to instill your law into my life so that that's how I live. I, I asked you to teach me your statutes and you did, but now I want you to instill it into my life so that I'm a truther instead of a liar. Teach me thy way, O oh Lord. Teach me thy way. I was going to sing, Teach me to pray, Lord. Teach me to pray. But you know that song. What a precious song it is. And that ought to be our... We need to learn how to pray like David did. The openness, the honesty <laughs> before God. And then the courage to lay God's word out and measure our life according to it. And then when we realize that, that I don't measure up, then we cry out to God for help for victory over sins. Maybe, maybe. well, we all have the sin lying in our lives to some extent. And we need to cry out for help for that. But there's a thousand other things we need to get the victory over. We cry out to God for help. God would make his law part of my everyday life. And you say, well, I like to pray, but I don't want to ever pray out loud and acknowledge any of my sins. You know, people would find out that I'm a sinner. <laughs> Relax. We already know. Okay? <laughs> Don't let that worry if you think we might find out that you're a sinner because we all are. And if we're honest before God, what we ought to be, and honest before each other, we're pilgrims. <laughs> Josh just played. I am a pilgrim wandering through this weary world and we're struggling with sin and we're trying to gain the victory over it and that victory comes in Him. Amen. So we cry out and, and we acknowledge that sin. Amen. Uh, I already got, I jumped ahead of myself here, but that verse 29 uh, was, the, was the example of it. Psalm 119, and verse 29 and 30, uh, an example of the conviction of sin and lying. Now I want to talk about uh, the enlarged heart. You notice down there in verse 32, Psalm 119, verse 32, I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. A few months back, I went to my new primary care physician, and uh, he spent a great deal of time with me talking about everything, one of them gave me the complete physical, and when we were talking about my family health history, he said, have you ever had any heart problems? I said, none. His baby's a, great. And uh, so he, after a while, he talked, looked over the family health history, and he gets out his phone right while we're talking. He says, hold on a second. He calls up Dr. Varon, chief cardiologist at RGH, and he says, I got a man here that needs to see you. I want you to run a full gamut of tests on his heart. And I'm thinking, no, I'm, I'm great. So anyways, I got home. Within five minutes, the heart doctor called and had an appointment the following Tuesday for me. And so they put me through all the tests over the next couple of weeks, the electrocardiogram and the stress test, and I aced that baby. I got on the treadmill and ran for, I don't know, 15, 16 minutes. They said I set a new record, the best this week. Of course, I had the Monday morning 8 a.m. appointment. <laughs> I don't know when it was. They did say I set some new record, you know, anyways. But, so I said, yeah, I told them my heart was great. And, and then he sent me in for a a calcium CT scan or something anyways and then I get back to see the doctor get the report on all this and he says you know what you got problems <laughs> you got super ventricular tachycardia which is an electrical problem and uh, you've got a leaky valve it's not real serious yet but could be we got to keep an eye on that two of your major coronary arteries have significant buildup of calcified plaque. And uh, that's a problem. And then he says, and your aorta is enlarged two, two millimeters from aneurysm stage. He says, that's a problem. He says, because when that bursts, the folks at church will be looking for a new pastor because there's no saving you from that. You're gone. 
none of these four things are in critical stage at the moment, though any of them could become that sh <coughs> soon, or the combination of any of these could be fatal. So I said, oh, okay then. I got some heart problems. <laughs> I have another heart problem that my heart isn't as large as it should be. David's wasn't either. And that's why in verse 32 he cried out, for God to enlarge his heart. Enlarge my heart. There's a condition spiritually in us that if our hearts are not large, enlarged, it's critical. <laughs> Let's go over to 1 Kings. We'll come back to Psalm 119 eventually. Today or tomorrow or later this evening. <laughs> but 1 Kings chapter 4, we see that this word enlarged, enlarged heart is used a couple other times in Scripture. And it's used of Solomon in, in 1 Kings chapter 4 and verse 29. And it says this, 1 Kings 4.29, And God gave Solomon wisdom, and exceedingly great understanding and largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. And thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Israelite, the Heman, Calcol, Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. His songs were 1,005. He spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, of fish. All men and men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. <coughs> Solomon... <coughs> had an enlarged heart, and I think that uh, part of that was the intellect, his vast capacity of knowledge, of facts and figures, of everything. And not just the facts and figures, but the wisdom to analyze, to dissect, to come up with a solution to complicated and complex problems. He was, his wisdom, his knowledge was, was beyond anything anyone can imagine. In fact, it talks there in verse 20, uh, the last phrase, they're like the sand on the seashore. It was innumerable. It was immeasurable. His IQ was off the charts. There was no IQ chart that could measure this intellect. I remember when I was a kid, my grandma asked, Timmy, are you, how smart are you? Are you in the top half of your class? I said, Grandma, no, I'm one of the ones that make the top half possible. <laughs> His wisdom was innumerable. I, I know if he would have been on Je Jeopardy, he would have been the world grand champion and disputed forever. He does a Rubik's Cube blindfolded with one hand behind his back. <laughs> Solomon's wisdom, intellect, ability to grasp, perceive, to understand was, was so vast and comprehensive. And he wasn't, he wasn't a specified genius. You know, today we everybody specialized in a field, and this is his field of expertise. And, well, you couldn't ask Solomon, what's your field of expertise? What's your specialty? He was a special expert, a genius in every area. It didn't matter whether it was the, the trees or the weeds that came out of the wall or the animals or the fish or marine biology. It doesn't matter. He was a genius in everything. Ultimate capacity of mind to understand and comprehend. And by the way, lest anybody think intellect understanding is how you get saved because I'm smarter than someone else? Or if intellect, understanding, and human wisdom is able to keep a person from falling into sin? It doesn't. Solomon, the wisest, smartest man ever on the planet Earth, had his heart turned away from God. Our only hope for deliverance over sin, our rescue from sin, our triumph over sin is found in God's grace and His power, not in our own intellect. So 
So it doesn't matter whether you're a third grade dropout or whether you're the valedictorian of Harvard Law School. Our hope is always in the Lord. But not only did he have this vast, enlarged heart, capacity for intellectual and knowledge and wisdom, but he was blessed with so much and, and resources and wealth and gifts and abilities and music and poetry. See, he wasn't a one-trick pony. He had it all. But his heart was also enlarged to be generous, to share with others and to bless those and to know how to, he put his, his knowledge and his wisdom to work, to bless others and to help others. He knew what was the most judicious and the best way to further and help other people. And so his, his, uh, his enlarged heart was not only intellectual and wisdom, but, but goodness and generosity and helpfulness to others. We need that kind of largeness of heart too, don't we? Too often we are stingy, self-centered, self-focused. This is mine. I got this. Now remember Solomon also, and we read it in Sunday school this morning, Ecclesiastes 2.24. He recognized that all he had, <coughs> this was also from the hand of God. And maybe if we would recognize that all we have is from the hand of God, all of our knowledge, all of our wisdom, all of our wealth, all of our possessions, all of our gifts, anything that we've got worth anything, is because God has granted it to us. Amen. And we're to be stewards of it and use it for his glory. Amen. And then turn over to Isaiah chapter 60. Here's another illustration of enlarged heart. Isaiah chapter 60, and I believe this is talking about the kingdom age. <laughs> Following the tribulation period, following the seven years of great tribulation on planet Earth, the Lord Jesus Christ himself will descend from heaven in all of his glory, and the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever. And he's going to reign from Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem, over there in Israel. And uh, Jesus Christ in all of his glory will reign with a rod of iron in Jerusalem. And is, he will set up a kingdom of righteousness and peace and, and uh, holiness. And there in Jerusalem, in Israel, people from around the world will be flocking. Because there's going to be a great conversion. God's spirit, remember, is going to be being poured out and and. Israel, Romans chapter 11, Israel is going to be saved. There'll be a tremendous revival among the Jews around the world. And they'll be gathered together from the four corners of the earth. And they'll be coming back to Jerusalem, to Israel. And to see the king in all of his glory. The king of kings now enthroned. And, and so this great time here now. But not only Jews being saved and coming from afar. But Gentiles are being saved and brought into God's kingdom. <laughs> What does it say here in verse 4? Well, verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to your light. The kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant. And your heart shall swell with joy. I mean, it will be enlarged with joy. Because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. So there's going to be an enlargement of their heart. Their hearts are going to swell. I think it's a combination of a bunch of things. They're going to swell with fear of God. There's, there's the idea of fear also involved here. Um, of a reverence for God. Can you imagine these saints now in the kingdom age and Christ himself has come from heaven with the angels in all their glory and he's conquered the nations and set up his kingdom and we are the redeemed, the awe that they would stand in to behold the king, Jesus, glorified. He's no longer the suffering servant, the sacrificial lamb. Now he's come back as the lion of Judah. He's come back as the conquering king. There he is enthroned in Jerusalem. And people 
the saints now stand in awe and fear. This is God's doing. This is the mighty work of God. This is God bringing to end the consummation of world history, of what his world and word has told us. This is God at work. This is unbelievable. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord. So they stand in awe and fear, reverence before God. And there's also a joy, the joy of the kingdom, the joy, the blessings of the kingdom of God being realized now. I, I just can't even imagine. But there's also an enlargement of their hearts in their welcoming and receiving all these people that are coming. And that's the idea here. They're flocking in from all these nations. And in fact, it says your heart shall swell with joy because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. Now, I don't know what the abundance of the sea is. It may be that the wealth of the sea, all the produce that comes out of there, shrimp and lobster and all that kind of stuff, as well as seafood and sushi, I don't know, anyways. All the wealth, all the produce, as well as the minerals and the petroleum, whatever is, comes out of the sea. Maybe it's the idea, the... Uh, the seed, the abundance of the sheep shall be turned to you or returned or converted to you. Uh, seafaring people, sailors, they'll be saved too. Think about those sailors. <laughs> Talk about ungodly people. <laughs> those sailors, those drunkards, yeah, they're going to be saved too. I don't know. Maybe that's what he meant by the sea will be converted. These sailors are going to be saved. Maybe it's the sea dwellers out on these islands around the world, people that live on these islands, they're going to be converted. They're going to get in their boats and come to Israel too to see the king in his glory. Uh, maybe it has to do with the sea-dwelling people. In other words, the people that lived by the sea. The Philistines, by it, for example. Israel's enemies for years. All their cities, their six cities, were right along the sea coast. They were sea dwellers. They will be saved, some of them, many of them. I don't know. The other thing is, the sea could represent the nations of the world. Sometimes the sea is used of Gentile nations. In Revelation chapter 17, God says, uh, the waters upon which the harlot sits, the waters, they are the multitudes, the peoples, uh, the tribes of the world. And so the waters, the seas, maybe represent all these other people that are being saved. Many of them were God's enemies at one time. And yet they're being saved, converted by the power of God as it's poured out at this time. And they're coming to Jerusalem. And their hearts are enlarged with joy and with a, with a, a, a hospitality and a love and a grace to receive these people. God's redeemed people. So it's a, they're enlarged with fear, with awe, with joy, and I think a receptive hospitality. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians. Paul in the New Testament talked about an enlarged heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. He says in verse 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Now, the cross itself is offensive to this world, isn't it? When you start preaching the gospel, many people are stumble at the gospel. But Paul says, I don't want to be offensive. My, myself personally, the apostles, we're not going to do anything in our ministry that's offensive that can cause people to stumble. Um, we, we don't want to be blamed. But he says, but in, but in all things, verse 4, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. We, in every way, we live as servants of God. We commend ourselves. We do things to, to demonstrate and to prove that we are the servants of God and we're here to minister to serve people. And, and so that's kind of like the topic sentence here of what follows. And so now Paul is going to give a lot of examples, some for instances of, of how they lived, the manner of life in which he lived that proved he was a servant of God. By the way, that word minister there is the word diakonai, I, the servant of God. But we are all out of here, servants of God. So he says, uh, in much patience, that is, uh, patience, uh, perseverance, stick to itiveness. We hung in there through thick and thin. In tribulations, in needs, in distresses. By the way, the, the life of a Christian, the life of a servant, isn't always easy, is it? 
Sometimes we think, oh, I'm serving God. In these labors, in sleeplessness. I think he's talking about willingly, though I'm sure sometimes unwillingly he's running for his life. But I think the sleeplessness with Paul says, I went without sleep a lot of times. Why? So that I could get up early to pray, so I could get more done, so I could stay up late, so I could travel through the night, so I could get here to do this, to do this, to minister to people. I went without sleep. And in fastings, <laughs> went without food too. <clears throat> Willingly setting food aside. I don't have time to eat. I need more time to study. I need more time to pray. I need more time to preach. I can go without lunch today. Anybody here missed a meal or missed any sleep recently? Serving people? That's what Paul saying. He says, I don't want to be any offense. I don't want to be blamed at all in the ministry. I want to prove myself a faithful servant of God. This is how I'm living, willingly. I don't know Americans want to give up any sleep or any food. And then he says, uh, he talks further here about his manner of life. Well, Paul, how did you do this? How did you keep on? Well, by purity. I maintained a chaste life too, a holy life. Knowledge. Knowledge of God, knowledge of his word. Long-suffering. See, some of the fruits of the Spirit are showing here, aren't they? Long-suffering. Perseverance that he demonstrated. Kindness. So easy to be... Nice if people are nice back, but in the face of imprisonments and beatings and persecutions and suffering and grief, it's, yet he was still kind and pure and long-suffering. This is, this is supernatural, isn't it? Oh, yes, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. He mentions that next, by the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit animates me. That's how I keep going. That's how I serve and live like this, because the Holy Spirit enables me to do it. By sincere love, that is without hypocrisy. Oftentimes we show some love, but it's maybe we don't really want to do it. We do it because other people are looking. Paul says, I love sincerely without hypocrisy. Mine is genuine. I care. I'll do anything for anybody for the gospel's sake. I'll do it for their sake because it's what's best for them. Not about, it's not about me. It's true love, sincere love is concerned about what's best for them. By the word of truth, verse 7. It's the word of God. He calls it the word of truth here. And what Paul taught and what Paul preached, what came out of his mouth, he just wanted to make sure that it was always the truth, teaching truth, saying the truth. By the power of God. Again, he comes back to that, not only by the Holy Spirit, the power of God. His life, his ministry was characterized by the power of God. In fact, that's what he said. I came to you not with excellency of speech or man's wisdom. Why? Because I want your faith to stand in the power of God, not in man. We had this treasure in earth and vessels so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. By the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Paul said, I put on the armor. I don't just write to you about it in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. Say, be strong in the Lord and put on the armor of God. I do it. It's the only way I can get through this life and the temptations and the struggle, the fight I'm in in the ministry. Or I got the, sword, the shield of faith and I got the sword of the word of God. And he says, I got the helmet of salvation on Paul says, I, I have to have that armor of righteousness too. And then in verse 8 and following, he gives uh, eight or nine different situations to talk about how crazy and unpredictable and hard his life is as a, as a, as a servant of Christ. He says, by honor and dishonor. Sometimes I go to a place and minister and they, they honor me. My name is elevated and the saints are glad to see me. And sometimes they call me a phony and they besmirch me and blaspheme my name and they tell lies about me. They dishonor me. I keep on. By evil report and good report, they slander me. They slander my name. Tell lies. Other times, 
Get good accommodate, good accommodate, commendations from these folks. As deceivers. And yet true. Sometimes he goes and people say, You're a deceiver, you're a liar, you're a hypocrite. You're just out for money. Other places, Paul says, they set me as true. Or maybe Paul says, I don't care what they call me, I am true and I'm telling the truth and I'm living the truth. As unknown and yet well known. Maybe sometimes he goes into a town, he's not known by any of the folks or any of the people in the city or the village. And he's well known by some, well known by the saints maybe in some churches. Maybe he's well known before God. I don't care if these people know me or not. God knows me. Dying. He was constantly faced with death, wasn't he? Threat of death. Behold, we live. He has eternal life. Maybe the idea is that even though uh, I'm faced with death all constantly, with the robbers and the uh, it lost at sea and bobbing up and down for days in the ocean and things that he had to go through. And yet here he is, he's still alive. God protected him. Somehow God protected and gave him life as chastened. He even recognized some of the stuff whether it was by men or by God, that he was chasing blow after blow after blow. He took, but he wasn't killed. Whipped, beaten, imprisoned. Here I am. As sorrowful. Yeah, a lot of that causes me grief. You know, getting beaten and thrown in prison isn't a joy. And yet even when he was in prison, he sang at midnight, wasn't he? So there's always rejoicing. As poor, yes, the world looks at it, he didn't have wealth or riches. Poor in the eyes of the world, and yet making many rich. <laughs> he took the true riches of the gospel. He took the riches of Christ. He took the riches of glory and gave it and shared it with people. Having nothing and possessing all things. This is what he did for the Corinthian church. And by the way, was the Corinthian church a model church? <laughs> no, but it was a typical church. <coughs> it was typical. If you read the Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and you read about those churches there, they all had problems. They were all full of sinners like us. They're all struggling pilgrims making their way. And so Paul talks to them, and, and after he gives this, he says, this is what I live, this is how my manner of life, and what I do for the ministry for, for a, as a servant of God. He says, oh, Corinthians, we have spoken open to you. I, I, I've spilled my heart to you now. I've opened up. There's nothing in me that's, that's uh, I'm holding back here. Our heart is wide open. Paul says, my heart is enlarged for you. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you people. As he just said, all this I do for you. Remember he also said that the, the, more, I, the more I love you, the less I'm loved. <coughs> but he keeps on ministering and serving and doing all these things. Become all things to all men that by all means might save some. And, and, and he, he makes himself a servant to all. Oh, Christians, we've spoken to you openly. We, our heart is open to you with love and and doing anything for you that we can. And then he says, you are not restricted by us. In other words, there's no, I think the King James word is the word straightened. Is that right, Ted? It's straightened in there? Yes. It comes from the word, it doesn't have a G-H in it, by the way. Like we would use straight, S-G-R-G-I-G-H-T. <laughs> uh, it's just the word T, straight as in straight jacket. The word, it's a word that means confined, restricted. And uh, probably restricted. We don't use the word straight very often today, but he says uh, we're not restricted um, in, in anything. You, you are not restricted by us. Um, our love for you, there's no narrowest or crampness in our heart. We are wide open loving you, caring for you, doing everything we can. Our hearts are wide open. He says, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now, I just need to take a moment because the King James uses this phrase, but you are straightened in your own bowels. 
It's one of the reasons we do need modern translations, okay? <laughs> because the word bowels in our English translation refers to the lower intestines, the innards, the guts. That's when you have a bowel movement, okay? Paul's not using the word bowels, straightened bowels, in any sense of the word here, like that. The Greek word bowels, or translated in the King James as bowels uh, here as affections, tender affections, is a word which originally meant the upper part of the chest cavity, the heart and the lungs, the liver. In fact, the Greek writers, the ancient Greek writers, used it of the, particularly the heart, that they would eat uh, in sacrificial victims, the heart of the lamb or the heart of a goat or whatever, and they would take that out and they would eat that during the um, the sacrifice somehow. But they, the bowels were the upper part and the heart. And they, back then, they attributed the heart, the heart of man, that was the seat of emotions. That's where <laughs> compassion and mercy and love came from. And so the word heart or bowels, they were almost used synonymously at times, that referred to a person's compassion, mercy, love. And so when Paul said, but you're straightened in your bowels, <laughs> what he's saying is you are the ones who are restricted, confined in your emotion and your love and your compassion toward us. Okay, that's what he's saying there. You are restricted by your affections, your own affections. You don't, the, we love you. Our heart is large. We love and care. We'll do everything for you. You're the ones that are narrow, confined, and you don't do anything for us. You won't receive us. You don't love us. You don't care for us. And so Paul, he said, uh, he says, now in return for the same, I speak as the children. I, I'm, I'm just pouring out my heart as like your spiritual father, like a parent to a child. He says, let me just tell you. He says, you also be open. In, in, in response to our love and care for you, you enlarge your heart. You open up to us. You need to have open hearts of love, affection, mercy, kindness toward us. Sometimes pastors pour out their heart and their life for their people. And they don't always get the response that they want. And I would open up my heart and say to you, you be the servants like Paul is. Enlarge your hearts. Be loving and compassionate. Not to me. Well, that'd be nice too, but, but to each other, to everybody. A visitor walks in here. Do you love them? Do you, is, do you have a large heart to get out of your seat and, and go over and greet them and embrace them and welcome them in the name of the Lord Jesus? Do you have a large enough heart to go visit the sick? To visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction? Did anybody go see Bill and Linda the last couple weeks? See, that is a restricted heart. That's calcified plaque in your arteries, people. And Paul says, oh, Corinthians, open up your hearts. Enlarge your hearts, love, mercy, care, compassion. And then we go back to Psalm 119. Oh, we've run out of time. <laughs> but just do it quick. Dave says, I, David says, I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. I think David is talking because he's prayed, God, according to your word, strengthen me, revive me according to your word, teach me your statutes, do all these things. So I think part of it is if God enlarges, or I should say when, not <coughs> if, it's when you shall enlarge my heart. It's enlarged with the knowledge of God's will. It's enlarged with God's word. It's enlarged with God's will and his ways. It's also enlarged with God's love to David. He understands and sees God's love. It's enlarged by David's love for God. A holy fear of God, an inner joy and a peace, an enabling power of the Holy Spirit, victory, removal of the sin of lying. All these things, David says, you're going to enlarge my heart. You're going to answer my prayer. You're going to deliver me from sin. This is the enlargement of heart David wants. And when God does that, he's going to run the course of his commandments. What does that mean, run the course of his commandments? Well, the course of God's commandments, the course, the ways, the paths of God's commandments. 
all of God's commandments say, do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that, be kind, be loving, forget, uh, don't, don't lie, don't steal, don't do this. And, and, and so every twist and turn in our daily lives is like a course, and there the Word of God is giving us direction. And David says, you're going to enlarge my heart, and I'm going to run. Run as in I'm anxious, I'm joyous, I'm excited about doing your, following your course, the course of your command. I'm tired of running my own ways. Remember we started back out when David declared his ways? This is how I've been living my life. This is how I've been running. I want to run your course of your commands. And that's what he says. God's going to enlarge his heart and enable him to do that. So my prayer, and I hope your prayer is, Lord, enlarge my heart. Like Solomon, yes, with the passage of knowledge and wisdom, but generosity and goodness and a blessing to others. Like the saved Jews, enlarged with a sense of awe and fear of God, with a sense of joy when we see the God working, with a heart that's open and receptive, hospitable to others that God is saving. Like Paul and the Corinthians, a heart that's enlarged with love and mercy and compassion and affection for others. And like David, Enlarged with a sense of God's love and his enablement and his will, his commandments. So we run now. Lord, enlarge my heart. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you make this our prayer every day. Take away from us the narrow, selfish, restricted. <coughs> straighten bowels that Paul talked about and give us, Lord, an open heart that we may live for your glory and run your commandments. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. <laughs>